church, allow yourself to go there. Allow yourself to go to that place. Lord God, we cannot live without you. We cannot live without you. Lord, we need you in our lives. Lord, help us to get to that place. You want to meet us there in your presence. Lord, we thank you because you are faithful. Because you are faithful. No matter what we're going through, the tough times, the sickness, the, 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 the times where we're crying and we can't, Lord, we can't do this alone. You are there with us, consoling us, comforting us. Your Holy Spirit goes before us. Help us, Lord, to be in your presence. Because in your presence, in your presence, there's abundance of life. There's abundance of joy. There's abundance of peace. It is your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we meet in your presence. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for meeting us here today. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is a time where we can gather together and be in God's presence. When we are together, we are coming to God's presence. When we're together, we're gathering with others who carry that presence of God, who carry his image, who worship together. That is why we do what we do. Because God is the only one worthy of our praises, of our worship, of us lifting our hands, of us paying attention. We are the only ones, he is the only one worthy of our attention and praise. And that is actually what we've been talking about, uh, what we started talking about last week when we're talking about the, uh, the, the, the gathering place, which is that, that series that we're in today. The gathering place. Last week we talked about the tabernacle, right? We talked about how uh, the, the, the people of God built a place, a place where they can go and gather together, a place where they can meet God. And God gave them specific details, specific patterns to follow to build this tabernacle. And in that tabernacle, there's a process that you would have to go through to be able to be pure enough, to be able to be cleansed enough, to be able to be holy enough to go and meet with this God. A God that they saw in a mountain, in Mount Sinai. You guys remember that part of the story? A God they saw on a mountain with thunder and lightning, and they were scared about even coming to the mountain. And God came down from the mountain and it said that the presence, the cloud, and, uh, 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 and the pillar of fire laid on the tabernacle, which signifies the presence of God in that place. And it said that the, the tabernacle, that, that cloud, moved ahead of them. And if the cloud moved, they would have to pick up everything and go forward. And we talked about how God leads us. God is there before us. Wherever he wants us to go, he's already going ahead of us to carve a road, to pave the road for us to be there. And that is where God wants us to be, where we follow him. Wherever he lands, that's where we land. Wherever he calls, we go. That is our job. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about this tabernacle because it's important to lay the foundation of understanding when it comes to this place, this initial place that God set up in order to meet with his people. You guys remember last week we talked about in, um, in Genesis, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, you guys remember what happened when Adam and Eve sinned? They, they hid, right? 
Because God was, what was he doing in the garden with them? He was walking. God set up the garden to be, uh, 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 the, the garden to be a place where he meets and lives with his people. Again, we think about God being out there somewhere in the universe, but the way he designed the garden, the initial design was for him to be there, to walk with Adam and Eve, to be in that garden walking with them, talking with them, communing with them. That was the intent of the garden. And then as soon as sin entered the picture, they started to hide, right? And we talked about, obviously, we, we've all played hide and seek, right? And if you're it, what, what happens if you're it? You go seek. And if you're not it, you go hide. <laughs> the kids know how to play this game, right? You go hide. You go hide and run away from the person that is it. And we saw Adam and Eve run away from the presence of God as he was walking towards them, right? So as soon as sin entered the picture, we start to see that what that causes is for us to draw away from God. So when sin enters the picture, it causes us to draw away from God, to move away, go away from God. And so this tabernacle, he sets up to restore that so that we can draw near to God. And that's what we're going to talk about, how this tabernacle was set up in a way for us to draw near to God and closer and closer and closer to God. So let's read in Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to ask you all to rise as you're getting it. It's going to be up on your screen, but look it up in your Bibles. Exodus chap, uh, chapter 40, excuse me, Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 9. Exodus 40, 1 through 9. You guys all got it? Amen. Amen. And it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Set up the tabernacle on the first day of the new year. Place the Ark of the Covenant inside and install the inner curtain to enclose the Ark within the most holy place. Then bring the table and arrange the utensils on it and bring a lampstand and set up the lamps. Place the gold incense altar in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Then hang the curtain at the entrance of the tabernacle. Place the altar of the burnt offering in front of the tabernacle entrance. Set a wash basin between the tabernacle and the altar and fill it with water. Then set up a courtyard around the outside of the tent and hang a curtain for the courtyard entrance. And take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all its furnishings to consecrate them and make them holy. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you because you've given us a design to be able to draw close to you. You've given us your word to be able to hear from you. You've given us prayer to be able to speak with you. And you've given us your spirit to be able to understand and commune with you. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for meeting us in this place today. We thank you because you're going to speak to us. We thank you because we understand that what you're going to speak to us will be, help us in our lives to get closer to you and to live this life the way you intended it. Father God, we thank you once again for meeting us here. This is your word. These are your people. Have your way with your word and your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Anybody been to Disney? Who's been to Disney? Raise your hands if you've been to Disney. I know you've been to Disney. You've been to Disney. Come on. <laughs> Disney. Um, is it exciting to kind of get ready to go to Disney? Is it exciting when you know there's a trip to go? There's a lot of excitement, right? You pack your bags. Once you, once you hit purchase on those tickets, the excitement starts. Right? You get excited about going anywhere, and especially going to Disney, especially if you're, you're a, a kid. Actually, even if you're not a kid, Disney's awesome, right? 
So you, you get on the plane and you land, hopefully in Orlando, right? You land in Orlando. What if that was the only thing, you, like if, if you bought tickets, if you went to go to Disney, but you stayed at the airport in Orlando, how would that experience be? It would stink, right? Because you had all these ideas of what Disney could be or should be. But you get on a plane, you get to Orlando, and you stay at the airport, and you don't go to Disney. You're, you're right there, but you, but, but you don't go. Or, or maybe you get on a car, you rent a car, you go to Disney. And, and those of you who've been to Disney, it's a huge place. There's so many things to go. There's a huge entrance, right, with Mickey and all of them. What if you get to the entrance, but, but you don't actually go in? Are you going to have fun? No. You're not going to have fun if you just get to the entrance and you don't go in. But, but let's say you actually go and, and buy tickets, and you stand in line for three hours to get in, right? You have to go early. We went super early, like before the line started, and we got in like in 15 minutes. But if you don't, you're going to be there for hours just to get in. So you, you stand in line, you get in, but you don't get on any of the rides. Are you going to have fun? You could, maybe, right, if you see things as home. But, but the fun is when you go in and be on these rides, right, and experience these rides and experience Disney for all its grandeur and glory, right? Us going to the presence of God is similar to that. It's great to say, I believe in God. That's good. Great. But there's more. It, it, it's great to say, I pray to God. Okay, good, great, but there's more, right? It's good to say, I, I, I read my Bible once or twice. Great, that's awesome. You, you, you got there, you got to the entrance, but there's more. God wants an intimate, very deep relationship with you. The problem, there's a problem though. What's the problem? Free will, okay, which makes us do what we want to do and go the other way, which is called sin, right? God sets up here a process of us being able to draw closer and closer and closer. And remember, we're going to talk about how this is just a picture, a foreshadow of something greater to come called the temple, Right, because this is a movable place where God moves with his people. And then later on, we're going to see that this is just a shadow of something called the temple, which was a permanent place in Jerusalem that was unmovable, huge. Everybody, it was like Disney. It still is. Everybody goes, well, there's no temple now, but Jerusalem is like that. Everybody goes to Israel. Everybody from all the area went to this temple. And how that then is a foreshadow of something greater, which is the church. And how the church is even a foreshadow of something greater which is to come, right? So this sets up a process for us on how to get closer and closer to God. So we read, right? He said, <coughs> Moses, uh, Lord told, uh, told Moses, put the, the tabernacle, put, put the ark, Right? This was a, a box where uh, we put the, the tablets and we put uh, some, some, some of the manna and we put Aaron's rod. It all went inside this box called the ark. And then it said, put a curtain there. Separate that from the other rooms. And then we get to the other rooms. The other room was where uh, there was a table for bread to be, freshly break bread to, to, to be there. There was another table for lampstands, like a menorah. You guys have seen that? Like the Jewish menorah with the different candle uh, sticks. So you put that to light up the room. And then God said, put a curtain there too. Once you set that place up, put another curtain. And then once you do that, outside of that, you're going to set up an outer court. You're going to put a wash basin so that when you come in, you're going to wash your hands, right? Before you come into that curtain, you're going to wash your hands. Bef Once you set that up, put another thing called the, 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 burnt, uh, the, the, the altar of the burnt offering so that we're going to have to put something on this altar before you get to the wash basin, before you get into the curtain, before you get into the holy of holies. And then put another curtain 
to divide all of that from the people. So there's a process that, we, that the, the, the people of God had to go through to establish uh, a relationship with him. So it said to place the burnt, the, the altar of the burnt offering, right? So we, God told them from, front, from back to front. So now we're going to go in, right? The first thing we go through is a curtain. Once we get in that curtain, what do we encounter? That burnt offering altar. You guys know what that was used for? What was that used for? To burn the offering. Right. So think of a huge, uh, uh, like, like a huge barbecue, let's call it, right? Huge. And these priests would take the offerings, these animals that you would bring, and they would butcher them, literally like a butcher shop. They would butcher them, and then they would put them on this altar. Why would they do that? Why do they do that? Yeah. He had a process to go through. And the reason why he did that is because you can't draw near to God without first dealing with sin. You can't draw near to God without first dealing with sin. And in order to deal with sin, there needs to be bloodshed. In order to deal with sin, there was blood that needed to be shed to deal with that. And so instead of you being the person that would, be, that would die and be on this altar, you would bring something that represented you. You would bring a living thing that represented you. And then the priest would kill that living animal and then put that on the altar. Well, back in those days, that was like bringing money because they used <coughs> the cattle as, as a form of trading. That was their money in that sense. That was, in that sense, that was kind of their money. There, there would be other things. There would be other things they burned on the altar, not just living things, but, you know, wheat bushels and all of those things. But there needs to be blood to be sacrificed in order for us to have relationship with God. It would be us that should be on that altar, that should be killed, that the, our blood should be the one spilled and put on that altar, right? That's what the Bible says, when you come, come as a living sacrifice. Come as a living sacrifice when you go to God's presence because there needs to be bloodshed. We need to deal with sin in order to be in God's presence. So that's the first point, the, the, the first stage. They bring the living animal, they kill him, they put him on the altar. Has anybody butchered? Has anybody been near a butcher shop? or Has anybody cut meat before? What happens? It gets bloody. I, uh, you know, and, and many knows this, uh, I, I ordered Butcher Box before, and it's like this meat subscription that you get in the, in the mail, and it's all butchered, and it's all in, enclosed, and it's kind of expensive. So I went to BJ's, and I bought this huge uh, 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 prime rib thing that you would butcher yourself. You would cut into little pieces. That gets really bloody. It gets really bloody. It gets, it's not bloody, it's myoglobin, but it, it, it looks like blood, right? All over yourself. So once you, once you go beyond that, these priests would be all bloodied up from all of this blood, from all of these living animals. So in order to go to the next place, you go to, what was the next part of the outer court? A wash basin. A wash basin. So they had to go to wash themselves. So once you deal with sin in a very drastic way, we got to deal with sin in a drastic way. If something is preventing you, if something, if you're caught up in sin, you got to deal with it drastically. Cut it, kill it drastically. Go to the next place and wash which is the wash basin. You cannot be, you cannot walk with God without being cleansed by God. You cannot walk with God without first being cleansed by God. So once you drastically deal with sin, you go and be washed. You have to uh, allow God to, you have to uh, allow yourself to receive the washing that comes from Jesus Christ. Remember, that on the altar, 
the blood that was shed should have been yours. Whose blood was shed for you and I? Jesus. He was on that altar. He was that sacrifice for us. He dealt with sin drastically on that cross so that we can then continue and have communion with God. But we have to be able to accept the washing that comes with us, that comes with that. When you guys sin, do you guys feel guilty? When you guys do something that you're not supposed to, do you guys feel guilty? Does that guilt sometimes prevent us from being seen or, or, or feeling worthy to even open a Bible or prayer? And imagine if you keep doing that over and over and over and you're just stuck in sin. Do you feel guilty to the point where you don't want to or you just think you can't go to God? Because how is God going to receive me? How is God going to accept me after I've done all of these things? After I told God that I love you, God, but I still did this thing, and I feel so guilty that I don't want to come to you. You guys experienced that? I know I have. Right? It's in that moment that we have to realize that the cleansing comes from Jesus. That the cleansing comes from the washing that Jesus does with his own blood to us. We're covered in Jesus' blood. We're guilty of Jesus' blood. But that same blood that covers us is what washes us. That same blood that washes us is that should wash away our guilt from coming to God. But unless you accept that truth, unless you accept that, unless you realize what Jesus did, be grateful for what Jesus did and accept that you're not going to be able to move forward in your relationship with Christ. You're not going to be able to deepen your relationship with Christ because you're going to be stuck in that guilt. And you should feel guilt because that's sh that should cause you to repent. But again, we got to deal with sin, whatever is drawing us away from God, whatever thing that we're doing that we know we're not supposed to be doing according to his word, drastically deal with it. Allow yourself to then wash, be washed by Jesus. Allow for that covering to, to take hold of you, to know that, yes, you should have been on that altar, but thank you, Jesus, because you're the one that was on the altar for me. That should cause in us a washing, a washing away of that guilt so that we can move forward to the next stage. The next stage is you come up, you go through the curtain, right? We read there's a curtain there. What's in that curtain? What's in that, what's in that room we read? A table with some bread and some candles, right? So we go in a room. It's a dark room because there's a curtain there. And we see a table with some bread, and we see a table with some candles, right? What do you think that represents? What do we know that represents? Come on, Christians. The flesh. Okay, the flesh. What else? Uh, we know this. See, if there is bread, then Jesus is the bread. Of Amen. The Bible says, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. So we met Jesus on the burnt offering table. We met him there because he deals with sin. We met him in the wash basin because he washed away our guilt. We met him when we walk in. We met him at the table now because he is the bread of life. We keep walking in in a closer relationship with Jesus, getting to know deep, different aspects of Jesus. He is the bread of life. He is the sustaining bread of life. Whatever you need, understand that he is the sustainer. He is your provider. Whatever bread you need, physical or spiritual, he will give it to you. Whatever it is that, that was causing that void in order for you to sin, he's going to fill it with his presence. Then you look the other way and you look at some lamps. What does the Bible say about lamps? Come on. Amen. Jesus is the light of the world. We know this. 
So you look in that, in that room, you see some bread that should recognize, you should recognize Jesus. You see the light, you should recognize the light of the world. It gives you a path onto your feet. Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp onto my feet to guide me. That lampstand lit up the whole room. Whatever darkness is in your life, God, Jesus, will light it up. Well, he's everything. He is. He is the path to that way. To, he is the way. He is the path to the presence to the more closer relationship with Jesus Christ. You guys are seeing this picture? You guys are seeing this? That as you go to the art of court, you met him in the, in the bird offering table. You met him in the wash basin. You met him in the bread, and you met him in the lampstand. There's another curtain. You guys remember that other curtain? The priests would go in that one time a year. Once a year, he would go into this back room, he would open that curtain, and go into that back room once a year. He is the only one that was able to go into that room. That priest in the Old Testament was the only one. As a matter of fact, these priests, after going through that process, were so afraid that they had to put a little bell on their tunic. You guys know what the little bell was for? To let them know that they were alive. Because if he dropped dead, that bell's going to ring, and there was a little rope tied to him. Nobody's going to go in there, so they had to pull him out. Right? That's how, uh, 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 that's how scared they were of that back room. That's how scared they were of that back room. So you had to go, like these, these priests, Aaron in particular, had to go back there with like fear and trembling because he had to be right with God. He had to be right with God in order to go in that presence. The Bible says that a couple of his, of his, of his uh, sons were just messing around with this thing called the tabernacle. They were just messing around. They were caught up in sin and they were messing around, going all over the different rooms and it says that the, the fire of the burnt offering consumed them right away. They didn't even get to the first room. It consumed them in the front because they were just messing around with it. We got to take it seriously, for sure. Our relationship with God, we got to take that seriously. That back room was reserved for a once a year thing. For one particular person was the high priest of Israel. In this case, Aaron would go in once a year to meet with God, to hear from God, and bring back some word. What was in that back room? What was so scary about that back room? The Ark of the Covenant, the presence. Right? The Ark of the Covenant was, again, this box. Wooden box overlaid with gold. It had two uh, um, angels, kind of archangels over it, and there was a seat on top of it. And that's where, the, it's called the mercy seat, where God would sit down. Again, that presence would fall, would sit down and meet with Aaron and the high priest in that moment. And you had to pour some of, you had to bring some of that blood on that seat in order for that to happen. What was inside the box? We read, what was that? The Ten Commandment tablets. The staff of Aaron, the high priest. What else was in there? Some manna was in there. You guys know what manna is? Remember in the wilderness, uh, the Israelites were hungry, they didn't have any food, and God made bread rain down from heaven and they would collect it, right? They collected some of that, put it in a jar and put it inside the altar, inside the Ark of the Covenant. That there's several things that are in this Ark that represent God's presence, right? The first thing we see is the stone tablets. What do we know about these stone tablets? The first time they were made, Moses comes down. What does he do? Why? Because he was upset. He was completely upset about what the people were doing while he's up there in the presence of God. Literally, God wrote them with his finger, and he comes down and he breaks the, ta the stone tablets. But let's put that in the altar. Let's put that in the ark. What was, all, what was the other thing you said? Manna, right? You guys remember the story about the manna? Why did God rain down manna? Because? Because they were hungry. 
They were hungry. But were they just hungry? Like, oh, I'm hungry today. They were starving. And what were they doing? They were complaining. God, why did you take us away from Egypt? Why did you take us away? We had all the great things over there. And you're here, we're here in the desert. I'm hungry. I'm starving. We got nothing to eat. So he made manna rain down. Let's put some of that in the ark. You guys are getting the sense here? What else was in there? That staff. What do we know about that staff? Is that the one that became a serpent? It's the, it's the one that became a serpent, right? It was the one that when they were complaining about water, he smacked the rock and water came out. All of these elements that are in here, we're just complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining about. Oh, I was going to say that they were reminded. <coughs> exactly. There were reminders that I was there with you even when you sinned. I was there with you. I'm establishing my covenant with you through these tablets. I'm establishing my covenant, my promise with you through these tablets. I'm establishing the fact that I am your provider, that when you need something, I am providing for you. That's the manna. Joseph's own. Joseph's own. They were with them, yeah. They weren't in the, in the ark, though. They weren't inside the ark. It, it went with them, though, and they buried them, but they, they weren't in the ark. And then the staff, to remind them of God's authority, right? All of those things represented God's presence in that moment. So God's presence provides for us what we need in the wilderness, right? So the manna, who is the bread that comes down from heaven? Not what, but who? Jesus is the bread that comes down from heaven. Who is the new promise, the new covenant, the new testament? Who is that? Jesus. Jesus is the new covenant, the new testament, the new tablets. He writes in us, in our stony, our fleshly hearts, he writes the new laws. And that staff, what does it represent? You, you turned into a snake. You, you remember that story. It turned into a snake. What happened when it turned into a snake? Devoured it devoured the other snake. So this, this staff was in the presence of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh had two other staffs, and those staffs turned to snake, and then this staff came, turned to a snake, and devoured that snake. Those two snakes. Jesus did away with that snake, with that serpent. With that enemy through the cross, he defeated that serpent, Satan. We met Jesus in the presence. He is the manna, the bread from life. He is the New Testament, the new covenant, the tablet. He is the staff that overpowers the enemy. So as you're coming into the presence, you're meeting Jesus in the burnt offering. You're meeting Jesus in the wash basin. You're meeting Jesus in the bread and the show bread table. You're meeting Jesus in the lampstand. You're meeting Jesus in the Ark of the Covenant. We have to grow in a deeper and deeper relationship with Jesus. We can't, our relationship with God should not be superficial. We cannot leave it in the entrance. We have to go from one curtain to the next. From the outer court curtain to the holy curtain. From the holy court curtain to the holiest of holiest curtain. We have to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ, in our understanding of Jesus Christ. As we understand and grow more, our relationship deepens more with Him. He is washing you clean from all the dirt that you brought into the home. 
right? That is representative of that as well. So it represents that night when Jesus was in the, in the upper room with his 12 disciples. And what did he do first? He washed their feet. And after he washed their feet, what did they do? He gave them bread. And after the bread, they drank the wine that represents the blood. It's all, it all ties together because the, the greater, uh, uh, the, the shadow that this was a shadow of is Jesus Christ. He came to, to, to make this for you and I accessible. You guys know what happened that night that he died? You guys know, so, so he died, right? Uh, and and he, was on the, he was on the cross, obviously, for many hours, suffered death, blood spilled. He then dies. A couple things happened. There was an earthquake. The, 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 the moon, the, I mean, the sun darkened. And that's so, that's so there was a huge earthquake. The sun got covered. All in that moment, huge miracles, signs, wonders, and then there's a, this thing rips? That, that thing? You're going to compare that to uh, an eclipse? And a, why is that important? Praise God. Praise God. It tore the boundary. No longer do we have to wait for once a year. No longer do we have to wait for somebody to go in there for us. We now have access through, through those rooms all the way to the Holy of Holies through Jesus Christ. As we encounter Jesus in all these places, we have to understand that this is just a shadow for us to understand how deep God wants our relationship with him. He doesn't want to remain superficial with you and I. He wants to go deep. The tabernacle structure from the outer course of the Holy of Holies symbolizes our journey towards the presence of God. It symbolizes our journey towards the presence of God. And the presence of God is only entered and established through meeting Jesus every step of the way. Every step of the way. Let us ensure that as we grow closer to God, that we're, as we understand Jesus more, that that helps us understand God's presence more. But we have to be willing to draw close. We have to make a decision to draw close each and every time. It's not easy. It's not easy because that first step, which is to deal with sin, because if you don't deal with that, you can't go through the rest of it. That's hard. Dealing with your stuff is hard. It's easy to deal with somebody else's stuff, isn't it? I mean, that's hard too, but it's easy to point fingers and to give advice and, oh, you should be doing that, you should. But when you have to point the finger at yourself and deal with your own stuff, that's hard. That's hard. But it's not impossible. God dealt with all of that. Jesus dealt with all of that on the cross. We just have to understand. We have to understand that that was already defeated. That whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're struggling with, we can burn it. We can deal with it drastically because God has already given us the power to deal with that. He has given us his Holy Spirit to deal with us. For those of us who have accepted and put our faith in what God did and what Jesus did on that cross, he's given us that authority to be able to deal with that right away. Which allows us to then go in into a deeper and deeper relationship with him. I hope you guys see this tabernacle thing. I know it can be, as you're reading it in Exodus, it can be very intimidating. There's a lot of details. By the way, God is in the details. God wants to, met, to deal with you in every detail of your life. There's so many, like, if we take the details that are, that are in Exodus, we can build this today outside. 
It's, it's to that level of Depot. We can go to Home Depot and, and, and build a tabernacle to that measurement. It's so detailed. What's that? <laughs> if we had the gold. Well, we could. So, again, the tabernacle was just overlaid with gold. So they had a little bit of gold and they, and they overlaid it with gold. But we, we have to understand this. We, we can't allow this to intimidate us. We have to understand that this design is showing us a pattern, is showing us the structure, the way to perfect relationship with Jesus Christ, with God himself, right? That is what the gathering place is for. That is what the gathering place is for. That is why we gather, to meet with Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you because you've given us a pattern that we can follow to a more close relationship with you. As we get closer to you, we understand other aspects of you. We understand who you are to us, that you were the one on the altar sacrificing yourself, that you were the one in the wash basin washing our sins away, that you were the one in the table, Lord, that you were the, the bread of life that provided the Jehovah Jireh for us, that you are in the life sand, uh, on the lampstand, uh, lighting, shining a light of the world to, in our hearts first and foremost and then to the world and that you are in that mercy seat that you sit on that throne that you are the manna that you are the, 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 the new testament the, the new covenant and that you are that authority that represents that staff that as we grow closer and closer in knowledge of you, that we can grow closer and closer in relationship with you. Father God, we thank you for making a way where there was no way. <laughs> Father God, we thank you because Jesus is the way, because you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody comes to the Father except through you. So you made the way. Father, we thank you. We thank you because you're, you're helping us deal with everything that we're going through you're helping us there you're helping not only us but our loved ones because we're praying for them and as we pray for them you are showing up for them we believe that we trust in that lord god lord we just thank you we thank you in jesus name we pray amen